take my heart and form it. Take my mind, transform it. Take my will, conform it to yours, to yours, O oh Lord. And righteousness, righteousness is what I long. This is what I need. And righteousness, righteousness is what you want from me. So take my heart and form it. Take my Take my
I'm going to take a second, turn around, and say hello to somebody.
Hey guys, want to remind you of uh, a big deal that's coming up. Every year we rent the Franklin swimming pool and we always have a big back to school party. So we'll be cooking hot dogs and, and uh, giving away things. And so we need you to make some cookies to bring and uh, you want to come and help do that and just uh, hang out with the kids. We're going to do snow cones too. So we need somebody doing that. So it's uh, August the 14th on a Sunday night at six o'clock at the Franklin swimming pool. So it's going to be great back to school pool party. I'll see you there. Hi, I'm here to tell you about the ladies retreat and give you a little reminder that it's time to sign up because the deadline to sign up for retreat is August 15th and it's real easy to do you just get you one of these handy little slips with all the information on how to sign up at the front table and uh, this year the dates are September 15th through 17th for retreat and it's good fun good fellowship it's a good time so I'll see you there thanks If you decide to become a follower of Jesus, uh, the way you start that is you get baptized to identify with this death, burial, and resurrection. So on August the 28th, Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock, we'll be baptizing right here at Carmody Park at, at Twin Creek in Carlisle, Ohio. So sign up for that. Let me know, and uh, we'll help you out. God bless you. Good morning. Good morning. I mean, you guys asleep? Doing all right? Good? The rain's going to stop. It has stopped already because I rented the swimming pool. And so we have a pool party. So uh, it's at 6.30. You need to be there at 6. If somebody wants to come by and help us load the truck about quarter after 5, that'd be good too. If you don't worry, it's at Franklin Park. Everything's free. We'll have hot dogs and snow cones and fun. Okay. And then next Sunday is Wildcat Sunday. We invite the football team to come and the different uh, sports teams and the band and everyone to come to church. And uh, so we need you to bring cookies. And I think Jim's going to cook, aren't you, Jim? He's, he's the grill master. He's going to cook. And the, I've, I discovered this from, from the kids that their favorite cookies are chocolate chip. Okay, their favorite cookies are chocolate chip, right? That, that, that is. So make sure you bring those. And uh, we have other things coming up too. We got to help the women's ministry made these little gift bags for uh, teachers, and so we got to give those out the other day to every teacher in Franklin, which was, which was really cool. And, uh, and we have some leftovers, so I'm going to Carlisle tomorrow. So um, I think that's it. Okay, you guys all right? Okay, we are in the book of Philippians. We've been studying Philippians for 11 weeks, and uh, today I want to talk about thinking right and living right. Th think, thinking what? Oh, the offering, I forgot to take up the offering. See, we quit, during COVID, we quit everything and, and messed me up. So I'm ready to preach and go get to McDonald's and get a hamburger. <laughs> let's say a prayer and we'll take up the offering. How's that? All right, let's, let's pray. Yeah, we, we have the offering boxes too, but we started trying to be normal last week, but I don't know if we could ever be normal. I can never be normal. So let me pray. Lord, just thank you uh, for your gifts. Thank you, Lord, that we can give to you. Uh, use these gifts to glorify your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll have to wait to preach now. I'll just sit here and tell jokes. Stay. 
still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Amen. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. We were still sinners. All right. It's so weird doing the offering that way. I mean, we did it that way for 100 years, and now we switched and we brought it back. And I told them the first service, one of my favorite, it's an old movie, uh, The Cross and the Switchblade. Anybody remember The Cross and the Switchblade? And uh, David Wilkerson was a uh, Assembly of God preacher, went to New York City. He was like a country boy to preach to these gangs and stuff. And then he, he set up a big rally at this big theater, and, and the, the, he didn't know this, but the rival gangs were going to come, lock the doors, and f- fight. But he picked the two top guys from each gang to be the ushers. So when they took up the offering, the, the, the guy would put in like $2, and, and the gangster guy would hand him the offering plate back, you know, and make him give more. So they got a big offering that day. So our, our ushers aren't gangsters. They're just ladies. So they're usherettes, I guess, whatever, right? Now back to Philippians. Philippians is a book of joy. The apostle Paul wrote this book to the church at Philippi. Paul wrote it from Rome. He was in prison. And uh, so it's, it's weird that he's, he's in prison. Uh, he, he's going to be executed. But he writes a book about joy. Now, if we were in prison, we would not probably do that. We'd be singing the blues and whining and all that. And, uh, but he wrote a book to encourage these believers because joy is a choice. You have, you have a choice to choose joy, and, and, and a lot of people don't, but we as followers of Jesus know that, that we have real joy inside, and, and uh, so he writes this letter to encourage them. So today we're in chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, and so I'll read it to you. If you want to follow along, if you have a Bible, you can turn there. It'll come on the screen. And, and he says, finally, like he said finally in chapter 3, but you know what that means when a preacher says finally? What does it mean? It means nothing. So, so Paul did that in chapter 3, and then he comes to another. And this finally really is going to be the finally. He's going to finish the book. So here we go. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. Amen. It's been said, I like this quote. It's been said this. A man is not what he thinks he is, but what he thinks he is. Our, our brains are really important, right? And, and we're supposed to use them. Uh, in, the, in the wisdom book of the Old Testament, in the book of Proverbs, it says this. For as he thinketh in his heart, so he is. And it's saying the way that we think affects the way that we live. So the mind is very important. It's very important in the life of a believer. It's very important in anyone's life. And uh, it's important that we use it, okay? Um, a lot of times we just waste it, and, and uh, we, we're not supposed to do that. Paul was one of the leading thinkers of his day. Uh, he was, a, he was a, a Jew. He was a, probably a part of the Sanhedrin. He was a Pharisee. He knew the law. He, he spoke Hebrew. He spoke Greek. He spoke Latin and probably Aramaic. And uh, he was not a dummy. And and, uh, because sometimes a lot of people think when you decide to become a Christian, that you just shelve your life. But I think going to follow Jesus is is the intellectual thing to do because it it makes sense. Uh, There's a book called A Case for Christ. I think that's it by uh, this guy who was, he was an atheist and he was a lawyer and he decided to search all these things out. And after he searched them all out, he became a follower of Jesus. And so it's an intellectual thing, I think, to choose to follow Jesus. Uh, and Paul writes that. Um, in chapter 4, verse 7, he talked about prayer, and, and he talked about how prayer affects our minds. And he, and he said this, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And so uh, he's writing about prayer and how prayer is important and the effect that prayer has on your mind, too. And so uh, we're going to look at some things that he talks about. First thing we're going to talk about is right thinking. Got that? You guys still here? Good. Here we go. Right thinking. He says this, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, if anything's excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Thinking and feeling go together. Okay? You can't, you know, if we want to live right, then we have to think right. Um, Isaiah says this, 
You, you, he's talking about God. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. And so Paul's saying that right thinking leads in, into a closer relationship with God. Um, most of the battles that you will fight as a believer are between your ears. Okay, they're in our minds. Uh, the devil's a creep. Um, he will cause you to question God. He will shoot all kinds of things in your head. And then, this is how he works on me. He'll shoot something stupid in my head. Then I go, wait a minute, I thought you were a Christian. What are you thinking about that for, right? And so just, he just plays games. And all the way through the Bible, you'll see that in the book of Genesis, he got Adam and Eve to question God, right? When he came to tempt them, he says, did God say this? And then even in the temptation of Jesus, he says to Jesus, you know, if you are the son of God, and he, he tries to work on our minds. And, and uh, the Bible says that he's the father of all lies, and he will work hard on your mind. Uh, but we don't have to be defeated as followers of Jesus because we have spiritual weapons. Paul wrote this in 2 Corinthians 10. He said this, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing it captive to every thought to the obedience of Christ. What he's saying is that, that we have spiritual weapons and, and that, that we have weapons to deal with things in our mind, and we as followers of Jesus can choose the right thing. Now, in our culture, we are overstimulated. You know what I'm saying? How, how many of you guys have one of these? During the first service, while I'm preaching, I'm getting texts. Okay, I, I got a really important text. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, I can't find it. It was a text to tell me how much time I've been on this. That's really important, right? So, so uh, yeah, screen time. He's got, okay, I, I need to know how long I've been on this thing, which I could care less. Uh, we're overstimulated. We, we are blitzed with stuff, with commercials, with, with these things. You know, you, you can't escape it. And it has an effect on your mind. All the media, all the news, everything has an effect on the way that we think. They, they did a study. This one guy said this. Consuming the news can activate the symp sympathetic nervous system, which causes your body to release stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline. And the guy goes on to say that, that physical symptoms may arise, not just from the news, but from all the media, from all the stuff that we're blissed with all the time. And, and uh, people are on these things all the time. Uh, if you ever go to a restaurant and you see everybody there on their phone, you know, not talking to each other. They're, they're all there, and, and, and that's just the deal. We, we have to be careful because we just get blitzed with, with stuff. We need to take care of our minds. Um, we're supposed to worship God, and we're supposed to love God with all our heart, right? And Jesus said this. He said this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your what? With all your mind. And so, so we're supposed to focus on him, and as we do that, he does something to us. It helps us to grow as a follower of Jesus, and it helps us to, to clear things out. So, my question, I think, is this. How can we learn to think right thoughts? Because it's easy to go down the wrong way. How many know what a rabbit hole is on Facebook? Uh, how many have ever been down one? <laughs> how many don't have, have a clue? How many could care less? <laughs> there you go. All right. Liz does that sometimes. Uh, like, you know... I'll say, I'm going to bed. Okay, I'm, I'll be there in a minute. Boom, 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 whatever. And she's, I don't know where she's at, okay? And, and you kind of get stuck, okay? That's a rabbit hole. I, I think there's something else uh, as, as we think uh, about that too. We, we need to learn to, to do that. There are things called mind loops, okay? You know what a mind loop is? A mind loop is this. You, you start to think about something, and then it leads to something else, and then to something else, and to something else. For example, if someone does something to you, if someone, some, something, someone does something to you and you don't forgive them, then all of a sudden you, you can go into this mind loop thing and you can think about it all the time and you can obsess about it and you can go round and round and round. And it's not just with forgiveness, it's with anything that you can get stuck in a mind loop. You can get stuck in a mind loop uh, over greed or lust or worry. You ever get stuck in a mind loop over worry? I mentioned Famy this morning, Tammy, in the first service. Uh, some people worry, and Mark mentioned it last week because I think it's been passed down about worrying after the fact. Any of you guys worry about something after it's happened? Huh? Tammy's grandmother, her name was Famy, but it's Fama, right? Combs. And uh, she, would, she would worry about what could have happened when a person was out on a date or what could have happened here or whatever. And people do that. And what happens is you start to think that way, and then you go to all these scenarios, and you get stuck. When the kids were little, we lived on, we live on Bryan Avenue, and it's a hill, and, and I was going to let Mark walk to school, 
And so I thought, I'm going to let him walk to school today. But people go up, it's 25 mile an hour up our hill, but people go 50, you know. And so I thought, I'm going to let him walk, walk, walk up to, to school. And so he, I let him go out to school. Then all of a sudden, I hear a car fly up the road. Well, my brain goes crazy, okay? I get in my car, and I follow and I, t- just to make sure he's okay, right? Some people do that to obsess. I mean, they'll follow their kids to Washington, D.C. They will do all kinds of things. But uh, um, oh, did I just say that out loud? But uh, I'm kidding. Not really, but um, mind loops take over, and we get stuck in them. And, and so how do we break out of this thing, okay? This is, I believe, that you break out of a mind loop. We have to, we have to, we have to learn to think right things, and we have to repent. Remember the old preachers preaching, repent, repent, right? Okay, and you know, you, you need to repent and, and change your mind and t- turn to follow Jesus, right? We think about repentance that way, but repentance means to change your mind. So as a follower of Jesus, we have to repent all the time. Not to be saved, but just to, to get out of this mind loop thing. That we have to choose, that I'm going to change my mind, that I'm not going to worry. Instead of worry, I'm going to pray. You know, if you've got enough time to worry about things, you have enough time to pray about things. And so, so repent is the way to break out of it, and repent means to change your mind. Um, we need to renew our mind. And, and Paul said this in Romans 12. He said this, don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by what? What does it say? The renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. A lot of Christians want to know what God's will is for the life. They think it's some mysterious thing, but God wants us to know. And as we renew our mind and grow in that relationship, we know what he wants us to do. Okay? I mean, how many of you guys are parents? Did you make your kids guess what you wanted them to do? You know, no, you, you told them, right? Well, God's a good father. He, he wants us to know what to do, and so we have to trust him. But the, the point is we have to renew our minds because our minds are just blitzed with stuff. And so we, how do we renew our minds? We do it this way. We renew our minds by living in the word, by prayer, by worship, by thinking good thoughts, okay? It's an important thing that, that we learn uh, to do all those things, um, Paul gave us a list of things that we're supposed to do. Uh, and, and he lists these things, and they're virtues. And, and he says this, things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy. He says that we're to think on these things. Briefly, I'll tell you what, those things, what he's talking about. The first thing, whatever's true, and, and that's real and, and genuine, the real truth. He says, think about things that are true, okay? Because there's so many false things in the world. And, and we know the world is crazy to even know what to do anymore. So we need to think about things that are true. And then he says, whatever is noble. And that means honorable, worthy, uh, and respected. Things that are good. And, and uh, we need to think about things like that. The next one, whatever is right. And, and that means just or righteous, doing the right thing between God and man. And so we need to think about things that are, that are right, that are righteous. Uh, whatever's pure, I think, is next. Things, that means morally decent, uh, spotless, things that are holy. And then, whatever is lovely, pleasing, gracious, lifting others up and not putting them down. The next one, uh, whatever is admirable, commendable, uh, reputable, a, a, a good report. Something has a good report about it. Um, is there any more? Excellent, praiseworthy, uh, conduct that wins the affection and admiration of others, even non-believers. We need to think about things that are, that are, that are excellent or praiseworthy or that, that, that you go, yeah, that's, that's awesome. I found a thing on Facebook this week. Uh, there was a Little League baseball player. It's in the Little League World Series, and the pitcher threw the ball and hit the other kid. You have that? Yeah. Let's watch it. I'm bored. Talk. Let's watch this. Here we go. This is really cool. Hits him right in the head. Now, if that's Major League Baseball, benches would have emptied and they'd been killing each other. Watch what happens, though. He's going to live, by the way, so don't get freaked out. Isn't that cool? The pitcher was so upset that the kid he hit came over and told him he was going to be okay. Now, that's praiseworthy. I think, you know, that, that you see, that, you know, like I said, in Major League, the guy would have been on the mound and everybody would come out and there would have been a brawl. 
But the kid, this kid knew he didn't do it on purpose, you know, and, and so that was something that you can think, wow, that's awesome. That kid, you know, needs to be encouraged. And, and, and Paul is, is saying those things. So what's our responsibility? This is our responsibility as believers. We're supposed to think, okay? Notice what it says. Think on such things, ponder them, meditate on them, dwell on them, uh, carefully take into account and reflect on these things. Paul's saying, think about these things, and, and these things will, will change you. In, in any language, there's different tenses. Remember English? Anybody remember English? Did you, how many loved English? How many speak English? Okay. I had an English teacher that drove me crazy, and I, and I didn't like her that much, but went away to college. She made us diagram sentences. Remember having to diagram sentences? I hated diagramming sentences. But when I went to college and I had to diagram sentences in Greek, she saved my life. So I came back to Franklin, went to school. I said, Mrs. Smith, you saved my life, okay? In Greek, or in English, there's different tenses. In, in Greek, there's the present tense imperative. And it points out to ongoing, continuous activity. What Paul's saying, this isn't a one-time affair, but something you have to do daily. We have to do this every day. We have to repent every day. We have to choose to think on good things every day because we're flooded with things that aren't good. And so we have to have the right thinking, but that's not enough because I know lots of people, they know the Bible, they know all the right things to say, but it doesn't have to be put into practice because Paul's saying that right thinking should read, lead to the second thing, which is right living. And listen to what he says. Um, Whatever you've learned, received, heard from me, or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Now, a lot of this stuff sounds like positive thinking, right? I mean, and, which there's nothing wrong with that. I, I'm old enough to remember a, there was a preacher named Norman Vincent Peale, and he, and he wrote a book called The Power of Positive Thinking. Anybody ever heard of him before? Uh, and then there's another preacher who, who was sort of next in line. His name was Robert Schuller, the Crystal Cathedral, and he talked about possibility thinking. And now there's Joel Olstein. You know who Joel Olstein is? He smiles a lot. Right? But his messages are, are positive thinking too. There's nothing wrong with positive thinking. But Paul's saying we need to think about these things. And if we think about these things, then it ought to affect the way that we relate to other people and how we live. Okay? And so he says, whatever you've learned or seen or heard in me, you know, do those things. You've, you've learned them. You've received them. You've seen me do it. Then do those things. And, and he says this in that verse. Practice these things. Put them into practice and, and start living that way. Jesus kind of said the same thing. If you remember um, at the Last Supper, Jesus took off his outer garment. And he wrapped a, a towel around him. He got down like a slave and washed the disciples' feet. And, and then, he, then he got up from, from that and, and he said this. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Okay? And Jesus had a brother. His name was James. We studied James back in the spring. And James said this in chapter 1, verse 22, I think. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And so all the way through... It's not about just gathering stuff up here. It's about gathering stuff up here and then putting it into practice. It's, it's head, heart, and hands. Does that make sense? We hear about it, we take it into our life, and hands means that, that we live it out, that we, that we touch other people and, and try to serve them and help them. We're supposed to live out what we believe. I, 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 I uh, read church for a hobby. Do you read church signs? Some of them are insane. When Paul was little, I would, we'd drive by and I'd say, Paul, what do you think that sign means? He never could figure any of them out. You know, it's hard for me to figure them out sometimes too. And, and I, I remember, I, I, I wanted to do this a bunch of years ago. I never did do it. I wanted to start a contest and give a prize for the best church sign and the worst church sign. But I, I didn't do that because they would probably get mad at me. Uh, you know, I don't want any Christians mad at me. Imagine that, right? Uh, but I remember seeing a sign once on a church wall, and, and it said this, unless we live out the things that we say we believe, it's just religious talk. Got that? Unless we live out the things we say we believe, it's just religious talk. And a lot of times we, do, we just do religious talk, but we're supposed to live this stuff out. Okay? And uh, uh, we're supposed to live out what we say we believe. But as I was studying this and uh, looked at this, I, I thought, who do they look like? Who do these things look like? Okay? Uh, who do these things look like? Um, so, I'm going to ask you. Here we go. 
Who is true and who is truth? Okay, let me help go back. I used to be a Jesus freak when I was a teenager. Had long hair. It was black, wasn't it? Donna? Hair was black, yeah. And uh, I hitchhiked around the country, and we would do Jesus cheers. We're not going to do one, but we used to do them. And, and the guy would go, give me a J. And the audience would go, J. And then you go, S. What does that spell? Jesus, Jesus. And then what, I can tell you guys are excited about this, right? <laughs> okay. So we're going to try this, but you're going, to do, you're going to do way better. Who is the truth? Jesus. Jesus. That's pitiful. Okay. <laughs> okay. We're going to try again. Go, go back. We'll test you guys out. Who is the truth? Jesus. Jesus. All right. Good job. Here we go. Who's noble and worthy of respect? Jesus. Jesus. Ah. Well, who said that? Someone was good. Was that you, Lydia? You want to come up here and help me? No, you sure don't want to. Okay. All right. Next one. Who is totally right and righteous? Jesus. You weren't a cheerleader in school. Next. Who is pure and spotless? Jesus. Jesus. Right. Next. Who is lovely and gracious and full of grace? Jesus. Jesus. Right. Who is admirable? Or it has a good report. Jesus. Are oh, you guys getting tired? Okay. Who is excellent or praiseworthy? Jesus, right? Okay. So the whole thing. I think you can bring up Jesus there, Pat. I think they got it. Good job. All right. This is the deal. Um, these things, if, if you read them, they kind of point us to Jesus. This is how Jesus is. And so as a follower of Jesus, if we, if we think right and we put these things into practice, we're going to live like Jesus. If you know what the fruit of the Spirit is, I said in the first service, and Liz made a face at me because I said it too fast. Love, I'll say, love joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, temperance, you know, th like that. that. That was the slow version, okay? Um, but if you look at the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is Jesus too, and so Paul is saying that we are to think right. And as we think about those things, we're supposed to do them. We're supposed to put them into practice. And because right thinking leads, leads to, to right living. Uh, Paul said this in uh, 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. He said, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Paul said that. He, he said, whatever you've heard or seen and received from me, put those things into practice. And you can look at it like this. Anything in Paul's life that looked like Jesus, do that. Anything that didn't look like Jesus, don't do that. Mark last week mentioned some things that people that he admired or whatever, you know, that, that, that he looked at their life and, and you know, w w was touched by them and thought they were an inspiration to him. And, and this is the deal. Whoever you, you follow as, as a Christian or, or whatever you think they're good, or whatever, find the good stuff that's about Jesus and do that. The other stuff, just pitch. If you see anything in my life that looks like Jesus, do that. If you do the, see a lot of the stupid things, don't do that. Does that make sense? And that Paul is saying that. All the things that you've seen in me, do those. As I imitate Jesus, then you imitate me because I'm trying to follow him. Does that make sense? Because this is the deal. The bottom line of everything, it's all about Jesus. That, that's period. And, and, and at the end of, of verse 7, I read it to you earlier, Paul said this. He says, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So he says the peace of God will be with us if we do that. But at the end of this verse, he says it this way, and the God of peace will be with you. God promises to be with us as we try to do these things. Now, no one has this down. but That's why we need to learn to use our minds, that we need to think on these things, and we need to put these things into practice. So this is the deal. Right thinking leads to to right living. So two questions. What's God saying to me? Thinking. What am I going to do about it? Put it in practice, right? So let's just bow our heads for a second uh, as we listen to this song. Maybe you've never come to that place that you've invited Jesus into your life. You know, becoming a follower of Jesus. And, and so you can do that today just in simple faith. And you can let us know about that and we'll help you understand it better. Okay? But it's learning to think right. Because all of us have a mind and all of us have to deal with craziness in the world. But we need to think on good things because we need to live right. Because people will never know about Jesus unless we live it out, unless we tell them. So let's just listen to this song.
If you have one of these, take it out, and if you can get it open carefully, give it a shot. Each week we share communion together uh, to remind us of what Jesus did for us and to remind us of what we're supposed to do, how we're supposed to live. In the early church, every time they got together, they did this. Uh, they would have a meal, and then they would have uh, the Lord's Supper together, uh, remembering what Jesus did. And so we always do this every week. And we say the Lord's Prayer just as a reminder of how we're supposed to live. Because the one part that, that always sticks out to me is, forgive us our trespasses. How's it go? Forgive us our trespasses how? As we forgive those. In other words, God, forgive me the same way that I forgive other people. So it's all it's this way, and it's, this way. it's never just this way. It's always involved other people too. And, and so Jesus did this with his disciples, and we do this too. Let's say the prayer together, okay? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is broken for for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And it says, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, new relationship. Do this in remembrance of me. And the apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, he said this, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we're proclaiming the Lord's death until he returns. We're remembering what he did. We're, we're announcing Jesus died and he rose from the dead. And we do this as, as remembrance. Amen. Let's all stand. Grab someone's hand if you like. If you don't like, don't. We got, we kind of untouched people when we did the COVID thing, right? So we got used to not touching people. There used to be a lady come to our church years ago. Her name was Barbara Barnes. And uh, she was Terry, Terry's mom. And she was a little lady. And she would stand back there and, and hug everyone who came in. Whether you want to be hugged or not. Some people go, oh, I like that. And she's, you know... She was short, so she hugs you around your waist, but, uh, but she didn't mind touching you. And her daughter, Terry, was just the opposite. Because I remember when I hugged Terry the first time, she just freaked out. But anyway, remember tonight, uh, 6 o'clock, Franklin Pool, uh, we're cooking hot dogs, snow cones, and all that stuff. Bring your kids, bring your neighbor's kids, or whatever, like that. It, it's fun. We have a good time. And then next Sunday's Wildcat Sunday, so bring cookies for that, chocolate chip especially. And uh, think that, and you guys are. I don't think in, anyone in here, a cheerleader ever? Who was? Were you? We're good. She was a cheerleader. And Janet was, of course Janet was a cheerleader. Why, why would she not be? And Sam, and you too. God bless you guys. I, I had four sons, and now I've got a bunch of granddaughters, and they're playing soccer, and three of them are going to be cheerleading. So if some Sunday I come in, I just look like I've been beat up or whatever, it's because I've been to a cheerleading thing. So no, no offense, cheerleader. So... Let's say a prayer, and we'll go eat. So, Lord Jesus, we thank you that you love us. We thank you that you died on the cross for us and arose from the dead. God, help us to put into practice the things that we know. God, we know so much stuff. You know, we got Bibles, and we got everything at our disposal. Help us to learn to live these things out so people can come to know you. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you guys. Have a good week.